happy to be here today. Uh, just a uh, quick riff on uh, uh, Zach's uh, uh, comments on panels and things. Um, uh, organizing my own conference, it's very, very difficult to uh, you know put things together. But just uh, the one thing that I think panels are good for are when uh, issues are complex and open-ended, as the uh, one that we're about to talk about today is. Um, and uh, there are many debates and opportunities uh, uh, in this uh, in this particular question about advertising and creative coding, but um, they, I, I think we are all trying to explore here a, um, a world where uh, creative coding and art can be a sustainable and expansive activity, and we've got a great uh, panel here to talk about that today, and we hope we can continue the conversation with all of you uh, afterwards. Um, today we have um, four great panelists, starting with uh, Jamie Ziegelbaum, who's an artist whose contemporary materials to create, uh, uses contemporary materials to create interactive sculpture, has a background in film, neuroscience, and human computer interaction, and spent 10 years inventing next generation computer interfaces at the MIT Media Lab um, and with his company, Midnight Commercial. Uh, Ziegelbaum has exhibited internationally in venues such as ours at Electronica, Design Miami Basel. The Cochrane Gallery in Saint Etienne, uh, International Design Biennial, the Creators Project, Tech Museum, Rifle, Ga Rifle Maker Gallery, Johnson Training Gallery. Um, moving on to uh, Vivian Rosenthal, who's the founder and CEO of Snaps. Uh, Snaps is a mobile app that helps customers engage with brands and social causes they love and encourages users to be content creators and brand ambassadors. Um, it's already, uh, Snaps has already helped dozens of brands activate their consumers, including Nestle's, Fox Studios, Sony Pictures, Kate Spade, Baltimore Ravens, and the U.S. Olympic Committee. I'm going to cut these a little bit short, okay? <laughs> uh, uh, in uh, uh, second to the last is uh, Barry Thru, the director of software Obscura Digital, a San Francisco creative technology studio specializing in the design and execution of immersive and interactive experiences worldwide. He is the uh, creative technology director working to incubate emerging aesthetics in immersive and interactive arts. And our last panelist doesn't seem to have, oh, sorry, right here. Margaret Brett Kearns, who's a print producer and art buyer for 20 years and has worked at Goodby Silverstein Partners for nine years, currently their executive interactive producer. Her projects at Goodby Silverstein and Partners have included Project TP, a virtual toilet paper bombing experience for Google and Cheetos, uh, the waitlist campaign for Sprint, and the something that got cut off at the end of the paper. <laughs> right. Um, but I'm going to let um, uh, everybody introduce themselves with their work. Um, and starting with Jamie at the end, let's get started. Hi, I'm Jamie Ziegelbaum. Thanks for the intro, uh, Chick. Um, I'm an artist, and I work with contemporary materials. And I'm also I've also been doing things in the gravity well of advertising for the past few years as well. So I'm going to show you four projects, two artworks and two projects. Um, this one is called Pixel, and I made it recently this year. It was sold at the Philips uh, auction Paddles On, uh, which um, was the first digital auction in the kind of top, uh, I don't know, whatever, auction houses. Um, but it was great, a great experience, and really wonderful to be able to communicate this type of work through that. Um, space. But um, I, I made this piece because I'm really fascinated with the way that um, materials function in, in society. And it seems like if you go back, the process of technology has always been taking things inside of us and putting into the world around us. And we keep doing this until more and more of us is embedded into this built environment. And that changes how we think about everything. And McLuhan and Haraway have already been dropped tonight, which was great. And I mean, add, add a lot to that list. like. Uh, Feinberg and Castells and um, many others. And I think that these these materials, these channels and media affect us in incredibly powerful ways. The fact that so much of digital representation is mediated by these liquid crystal matrices. You know? And through looking into very closely how these technologies work and how you know, the electromagnetic fields of light gets changed by these polarizing agents and, and, and that creates colors and grids and the software behind it, um, and doing interface design for years, I feel like I saw it in a certain way that I wanted to communicate. So we took the pixel, you know, the single little unit of representation that's in all of our screens and made it big. So this piece is a meter square pixel. And it is a pixel. It's not a representation of a pixel. It is a pixel. And when you touch it, it changes color, and it can sense you and respond to your body. 
um, because most pixels don't, right? Um, or at least they're pretty far from the body. Here's it at, uh, at Philips. And this is another piece that I'm working on now. It's a prototype called Triangular Series um, that I made with help from a lot of people, including Luna Chen, who's in the second row there, and a bunch of people in my studio and friends. And it's an it's a interactive lighting installation where another kind of part of this oh, kind of theme that runs through all the things I can't stop thinking about is you know, communication and how materials affect communication and also how we divide things you know, through these through the perception of our sensory systems, what's organic, what's not, um, what's life, what's not, what's me, what's not. Um, this piece is, uh, we're constructing a kind of um, other type of organism that breathes with light and it, it senses your motion and your rhythm and it grows in software and then we build it and install it. We sense an environment for a month and, and then grow the software simulation of these kind of crystalline shapes, these stalactites and then we install them, and they have this kind of sophisticated sensor platform so they can tell who's walking underneath them and you can communicate with them um, in a kind of hopefully subconscious way, but also direct. Uh, we're still building this one now. Um, then here is one of the two kind of commercial projects that my studio, Midnight Commercial, has done. Uh, I started the studio this year, uh, but have been doing work like this for quite a while. This one's called Barista Bot, and it was a collaboration with Hypersonic Engineering and Design, Rock Paper Robot, um, and Kyle McDonald, and it was for GE. Uh, it was shown at South by Southwest. It's a robot that will reach up and take your picture, and then it'll draw a, a drawing version, not a bitmap version, a kind of interpretation of your face in the foam of a latte using coffee as ink. Uh, and we showed that this year at South by Southwest. There's an image of, of the picture. Um, and you can drink it, and it's delicious. Um, <laughs> Uh, this is another project we did a few years ago called the Timepiece Explorer with my previous studio, Zigglebaum and Quelu. And it, it's an interface for exploring video in a kind of novel way. And I think I have some video of this one. Um, so if I can skip around, that'll be useful. But uh, maybe I can't. Um, This might not work. Uh, the, uh, th this piece, the, we use a sensor called the Zero Touch Sensor from, uh, invented by John Moeller, who works with me now. And it uh, allows us to do this optical hull sensing um, using a kind of uh, op visual tomography. And it's like multi-touch sensor with, with this frame, with very cheap components. And, but it's interesting because you're sticking your hand through this frame to control visuals and you don't have much feedback. So we made this feedback system with this cursor and you can move around very easily and you play a video by kind of pushing it like a stream. Um, but I think I've gone too long. So this is on my website if anybody wants to see more. Thanks. Hello. Um, <clears throat> I'm Barry Thru. Uh, I You're statistically more likely to find me in San Francisco than most places these days. Um, and if you kind of have a drink and squint really hard, I guess I'm an artist. Um, today, however, uh, I'm wearing the hat of, uh, I'm the software director of a company called Obscura. Um, and we're really focused on uh, experiential projects, things that happen in real space, um, immersive and interactive environments, and building these things um, for a variety of uh, clients. Um, I'm just going to show a few quick slides of the types of projects we do. Uh, architectural proje projection mapping is one of the big things that we're involved with. Uh, this is for the Exploratorium Museum opening in San Francisco, the new, the new location by the pier. Um, other types of projection mapping projects. We do a lot of these types of civic projects. This is the Sheikh Zayed Grand Mosque in Abu Dhabi, um, UAE, uh, for their National Day, uh, another large projection mapping. Um, a lot of interactive installation and, and interior spaces types of work, augmented architectures and things like that. This is another uh, Middle East project. Um, in Riyadh, this is for the King Abdullah City for Atomic and Renewable Energy, um, which, it, which they're building to, uh, they're consolidating all of their domestic renewable energy research in this space, and this presentation space explains the project so they can move it forward. Um, 
another primarily projected project, but there's a lot of interactives in here as well. And then we do some large scale walls and things like that. This is a data visualization for the Public Utilities Commission in San Francisco, um, showing the uh, path of water from Hetch Hetchy, which is our reservoir, down to the bay. And this is a, another interactive project for America's Cup. And so we deal with all these things in this space, and that might be it. Oh, and we, there are also um, a lot of commercial projects that we undertake. Um, this particular project was for Facebook. It's, a, it's kind of a real-time data visualization of people's social connections. Um, at the, their fake conference, you got an RFID badge with your profile information attached to it, and you could walk up to this thing and log in, and then it would visualize who you were connected to in the in the environment. And uh, lastly, this is a large, another projection mapping project for Coca-Cola for their 125th uh, anniversary that was in Atlanta in 2010. Um, so anyway, there's this wide range of projects that we undertake, some of them commercially based, uh, some of them civically based, um, whole bunch of money sources going into these things, um, which I'm sure we'll get into later. And he hands it to me. <laughs> so I'm Margaret Brett Kearns. I work at Goodby Silverstein and Partners in San Francisco. And we've actually worked with Obscura on some projects. Um, I started, as Chick mentioned, I started my career as an art buyer and print producer. And in 2007, uh, moved over to the interactive side, and it's been it's been a great sort of rejuvenation for me in my career and learning, you know, compl a completely new way of thinking about things and a new way of working. And yet, there's sort of a through thread of the kinds of folks that we work with. When I was on the on the print side, I was very fortunate to work with some wonderful photographers, um, you know, Richard Avedon and Andreas Gruski and Mary Ellen Mark and just had some wonderful experiences there. And even though, yes, I work for an advertising agency and we work with a lot of big brands, as was mentioned, Frito-Lay and Adobe, um, we, we also really uh, are a community of creators and makers within the agency itself. And I have a little video just to give you a sense of our philosophy and the kind of ways that we like to work. Um, so maybe we can just play that. To do things that hadn't been done before, that didn't feel like advertising, you know, that kind of sneaked up on people. The way that we think about it now is in terms of making stuff people care about. That means to make things that are welcome in the world, that people come to, that enrich their lives, that connect with them emotionally. When approaching this chair, we really thought, let's just embody the spirit of Charles Williams. By allowing the chair to come alive, we allow the user to ask the chair questions and hence Charles Williams questions. The secret sauce has always been the people inside the company at any given time. Okay, so so some of the actually almost all of those all of those projects that were shown there are things that I was lucky enough to personally get to work on, and one of the reasons that um, I met Isabel and that I was got invited is because she had heard that I worked on the Adobe Museum, 
of digital media. And um, that was a project that was the first time that I had really collaborated actually with artists um, and, an, and an architect. So we commissioned an architect who came from um, Zaha Hadid studio and we collaborated with Tony Orsler and Mariko Mori, and we worked with John Maida from RISD, and then also Thomas Getz from, from Wired Magazine. It was a three-year-long commitment on the part of the agency. Um, the, the site is now no longer being updated, sadly, but um, it was a really great experience and, and, and gave me kind of a new way of thinking and about the type of work that we did and the way that we worked with these people who were, you know, coming into this interactive realm. So, you know, along with that, um, in the last, since, since I worked on that project, we've now incorporated some creative technologists who you saw in the Eames Adobe piece um, that was in the video. Uh, and they have honestly really started to change the culture within the agency. So moving us really from being very traditionally based to suddenly bringing this new sense of a different kind of creativity and this whole that whole maker culture that was just discussed now we almost have a laboratory in the middle of in the middle of the agency working with the creative department so um, that's basically who we are thanks um, can you pass the computer Hi, um, I'm Vivian. All right, hold on. Thank you. Let's see. Um, so, I'll, um, I guess I'll start with a video, but before I do, um, just a little bit of background. So, I started as an architect and um, became really interested in thinking about how we we're going to move from um, an online space to an offline space. and somewhat of a misnomer in terms of offline is obviously still extremely hyper-connected with smartphones, but still thinking about how um, we were going to interact with um, the world around us in, in new ways and just the way that the, the web completely changed um, commerce and communication. Um, it, I was pretty convinced that smartphones were also going to have that same um, massive impact. And so um, have sort of my work has steered more in that direction and become quite uh, commercial, where it was originally much more um, artistic. <laughs> and um, so I'm just going to show some examples um, and um, quickly. And this is um, this was a um, a campaign. This is an airwalk. We store. did for airwalk, and it was a virtual and so store. Is they are the world's first invisible pop-up stores. Stores that can be set up anywhere, at any time. Simply by using smartphones, geolocation, and augmented reality. We created them for the limited edition relaunch of the Airwalk Gym. To get the gym, people had to be in the right location, so they downloaded the Gold Run app, found the store, found the shoe, and bought it. It got a lot of buzz. Airwalk got five million dollars worth of earned media, and their e-store had its busiest weekend ever. Tell me what augmented reality shopping is and why that's going to be a big deal this, this year. This guy's a bit of a douchebag, sorry. Augmented reality is pretty rad. For example, in New York City, we've got <laughs> But, um, the point being, um, I don't know who he is, but, uh, but the idea is that clearly that it's the whole sort of idea that you have to um, see the product um, before you buy the product. And um, the idea of geofencing and using longitude and latitude to create um, a virtual store. And since then, we've launched these virtual stores all around the world um, with different types of clients. And, um, and so, you know, one of the things that um, was, was interesting to me was thinking about you know, storytelling um, from sort of the brand's perspective and, um, and the problems that a lot of brands and ad agencies and media companies were running into. And so clearly I think um, what we're seeing on a pretty global scale is that photos are the new language, right? And so 
that was, you know, Instagram made everyone a photographer, um, and um, Twitter sort of made everyone had a public voice. But I started to think about how this was going to evolve creatively, because I felt like there was a lot of ways that you couldn't express yourself through Instagram or through Twitter um, or four square check-ins or things like that. And so I kept coming back to augmented reality, um, which is obviously something we're more aware of now with Google Glasses, but thinking about how it could be applied in a mainstream way. So that that's what we've done. We've created an app. It's called Snaps. It's free on iOS and Android. You can download it. And, um, and basically, you can embed virtual content into your photos. So it allows people to express themselves in ways that they literally couldn't before. And so we work with brands, film studios, you know, sports teams, celebrities, social causes, um, to allow them to express themselves. And so just quickly, this is an example for the anti-bullying campaign for, it's called Mean Stinks. Um, and you could put you know, actual virtual hashtags into your photos, um, all kinds of 3D content, 2D content, and actually express yourself. And so it was really connecting these girls um, to a cause that they believed in. And you know, it's sponsored by Secret and Teen Vogue, and they bring it to life, but they're doing so in a way that actually allows them to speak to the consumer in a more authentic tone. Um, and this was for the Ravens, again, allowing fans to pose with the Lombardi Trophy or with Flacco with a Nestle drumstick. And you can imagine parents putting kids um, and drumsticks together. And Kate Spade um, and, and Despicable Me. And so a lot of times with film studios, we're working with these 3D characters um, that obviously kids love. And now they can see them you know, in their backyard or next to them and actually start to interact with them in a way that they, they couldn't. Um, so I'm going to wrap up there and, and uh, turn it over to Chick. Thank you. Okay, great. Okay. Well, thanks very much. I want to uh, probably hand it right back to you. But uh, the first uh, question that I wanted to start with is that um, for the three of you who started out working in, um, in artistic mode, thinking about personal work, um, what was it like making the transition to doing more commercial work? You know, what kind of um, psychological negotiations did you have to do with yourself about that? Um, um, and but but more practically, you know, did it actually change your creative process in any way to be dealing with a large enterprise and a great many more stakeholders and things of that nature? Do you want to go first, or should I? Go? Okay, all right. I feel like we can all address this question. <laughs> um, I know personally, um, you know, I still, I still paint. I still think of myself as an artist, but I, certainly my day-to-day -day work is very commercial. And so it is something that I was, it was a very um, conscious decision and um, one that I, you know, I don't regret um, in some ways, and in some ways I do, um, in the sense that, you know, I think once you decide to go down the commercial path um, and work with clients and investors and, you know, people outside of yourself, you have to be willing um, to take a very, very collaborative approach and not work um, in a vacuum on something just that you're passionate about, but really thinking about how does this, what's the, you know, how does this affect other people? What's the return on investment? How does it, how does it make money? Um, so it's a whole slew of questions that, um, you know, that are really pressing. And they're really interesting ones, but they completely change the dynamic of, of the work. And so now I spend most of my days, quite honestly, dealing with lawyers, um, dealing with investors, and dealing with clients, and um, very little time actually getting to be creative you know so I think it's like whether that that might sound horrific or it might sound appealing to the people in the room um, and um, you know but it was something that I wanted to personally learn how to do um, so I didn't give a whole the history of my background and how I you know so it's there's some information not there um, but I transitioned into doing commercial work, I guess pretty early after I got out of school. I, I have a music background, and so I was doing that for a while, and then the um, sound recording and the whole industry collapsed, unfortunately. That's a, that's a hard, hard haul there. Um, 
I guess I do, I like, you know, my, my practice is to do projects uh, that are experiential and immersive. Um, I like audiences to be kind of inside these experiences. Um, and you have to pay to do that because they're, they can be very expensive projects. And so in the sense of um, being able to do the kind of work that I want to do, I think you have to have some avenue to enable that. And for me, commercial clients, all sorts of clients, are often ways to do that. Um, and so it isn't the same kind of, it isn't a split for me where I'm doing commercial projects that I'm really unhappy with um, and then making a compromise for my artistic practice on that. It's really an enabling force to be able to do some of these things that otherwise just wouldn't be possible because there would be no way to no way to fund them. Um, <clears throat> I don't think it's really a challenge for me um, in that there's no conflict. Um, you can do really creative projects in collaboration or for a client um, or solving a problem that somebody has already done a million times in school. Uh, and you can also do things that are really novel and require different forms of thinking. So in my art practice, it's one thing. In a commercial practice, it's a bit of another, although if you actually look at the processes behind them, they're almost always the same, which is great because they reinforce each other. Um, but there's a difference between you know, um, speaking about things you experience firsthand in the world and transmitting those in experiences on their own terms and trying to pass a message for another. Um, no value judgment necessarily between them, but um, it's definitely an interesting distinction mm -hmm. and causes a lot of people conflict, I think. Margaret, do you have a perspective on that from the agency side in terms of working with artists? Has there been some, you know, any kinds of specific ways that you needed to deal with them in order to, you know, bring them into the kind of processes that agencies are used to? Um, I think probably the Adobe Museum speaks most easily to that mm -hmm. question. Um, just as an example, when we worked with Tony Orsler, it was none of us at the agency had ever really collaborated so directly with an artist before. And he created a piece for us that had, if I'm remembering correctly, 17 components that made up his uncanny valley. And a lot of the, I, he, he, he had, he provided us with sort of an outline for what each of those 17 elements was about, and he gave us some assets to work with, but he gave us also some freedom to interpret his ideas. And so, in fact, we took you know, the basic structure that he gave us and brought it into our motion graphics studio. And I spent many months with a bunch of animators and post-producers and audio engineers trying to give shape to some of these thoughts. And it, it, was, it was really a mind-expanding experience for all of us because we were, we were really creating something with an artist, almost like, you know, a Renaissance studio kind of experience. And it was, it was, it was very fulfilling and um, just a completely different approach to creating work than anything that any of us had ever done before. It was frustrating at times and it was very iterative because of course he was in New York, we were in San Francisco, we we're just communicating you know, vi via whatever digital media we had. And in fact, I didn't even meet him face to face until the opening that we had here in New York. We had an opening party here in New York at the Standard. So I had, I had you know, sp spoken to him and I had emailed him. We hadn't even Skyped. I had never even, you know, we hadn't met face to face. So it was, uh, it was very different for us, but it, it, I feel like going through that process, first with him and then with Mariko and the other folks who we worked with, it really started to change the way the agency thought about how we would work. And I think it has brought us, it, it, it really helped bring us to where we are today. 
Yeah, I think that's uh, it's an interesting question also just in terms of the, uh, the artist's role in a commercial work, in terms of how much of a commitment to the process does the, you know, does the artist need to make? Is it an all-in uh, situation where, you know, you, you are making the work, you know, with another group of people, or are you simply providing, let's say, some ideas or, you know, uh, things like that? Um, I don't know if, um, if you guys have any perspective or any differences in, in the projects that you've worked on where there's a different balance in terms of what you're providing um, and, and who takes the idea forward from there. Um, sure. Um, yeah, I think that's a really interesting question. Um, I think the real key distinction is like who's speaking. You know, mm -hmm. I'm, there's a metaphor a bit, but um, if and now you're seeing a lot of brands more often just giving a platform for an artist or a creative person to do their thing, mm -hmm. and say we want you to do your thing around us. We want you to be near us when you do your thing because we like what you're doing and we think it reflects well on us. And if you look at the the history of advertising, um, this is a kind of practice born in an information scarce society where just yelling was really the way you could sell product. Um, mm. The more people knew the name of your brand, the more likely you were to sell. That was an efficient strategy for conducting a business. Now, in a very noisy channel filled with all these different media platforms and information access, being loud isn't, am amplification isn't really the way to send that signal. Just like the transatlantic cables back when Shannon was working on mathematical theory of computation, you can pump up the, ampli the, 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 the voltage or the, the amps as much as you can, you're not gonna get that signal through. Um, you, what you need to do is a way to clarify your message. And uh, I think that's what a lot of this kind of, the change between an ad agency hiring an artist in the past to say, make this pitch look good, mm -hmm. to one hiring an artist to say, we think you reinforce our brand and we think there's an authentic connection here and we want to be better at communicating who we are as a company. And I think that's, a, that's kind of a great thing. Um, yeah. and it's a significant change. Yeah. Oh. Sure. Um, I absolutely agree. Um, one thing, though, that's interesting is I feel like there's two different directions that brands are taking. One is to align themselves, um, align themselves with an artist that they feel like represents the brand in a positive way. Um, and somehow sort of buy cultural cachet through, through that association. Um, but the other, and that we're exploring, is kind of the absolute inverse of that, where it's like, let's put um, sort of creative control in the hands of anybody, right? And so it's not one well-known artist. It's, you know, it might be the 14-year-old kid in Minnesota who happens to be really creative and is going to make something great. Um, and so we're sort of trying to democratize the approach um, that brands might take to reach people and to cut through the clutter um, by, by sort of turning real people into, um, into the ones with the voice. So I, I feel like both, uh, both things are, in my mind, are happening simultaneously, both sort of the artist as, as an extension of the brand and then also you know, giving people tools for engagement so that they become part of the brand. Um, well, one other question about uh, that, that came up my, in my mind, and this discussion also was just from, from, let's say, from an artist's perspective. How do you make working with advertising agencies uh, work for you to sustain your practice? You know, is that something that, um, uh, that, that you're doing sort of consciously, or is it just something, you know, a world that you move in and out of, or uh, how, would you, uh, how would you express that? Barry, you got, uh, yeah. you got an idea on that? <laughs> yeah, um, I mean, I guess the, the, the funny, it, the thing to make sure happens is when you're building these experiences and working with brands, I mean, the thing that we're all afraid of, I think, is letting that experience get too watered down by concerns that aren't um, directly related to the quality of the project. Um, things that compromise the experience that you're trying to make uh, by having whatever marketing or any other any other set of concerns involved um, in what you're trying to do, and that's always the tricky thing to push back on on all the time. I mean, I'm not sure if I understand the is in terms of um, work with advertisers reinforcing my art practice. Well, uh, on a practical level, on a practical just a, level, yeah, you know, just moving in and out of uh, two different worlds, or uh, even the 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 issue of uh, ownership. Um, yeah. Um, know, is, uh, 
I mean, the, 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 um, one of the tricky things is always the credit issue. You know, you wind up working on projects. You know, I have a vast amount of uncredited projects out there. Um, that's something you just kind of have to deal with, I guess. I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't know an answer for that, really. We try and, uh, personally, from Obscura's standpoint, we try and um, put out press with as many players as we can, you know, that, that contributed to one of our projects out there. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess that, I mean, the answer in terms of my own art, I, I, I agree with Jamie in that it's not a conflict. So the, the, my commercial work is very much um, in the same vein as the stuff I do in my artistic practice. So there's just skill building and like ideas that form there that get transferred over back and forth. Uh, and also it's, I kind of prefer having the uh, kind of financial arbitrage barrier between stuff that I choose to do as, you know, personal projects and the commercial work. Um, just for my own work, I, I kind of prefer the case where I don't have to worry about monetizing the personal work that I'm making, um, because you know, for me, that's taken care of other ways. So I think that's a. Everybody kind of has their own perspective on that, but I prefer that line to be clear because it makes doing my personal projects it, it gives them a lot more freedom in certain ways than tying money to. Um, thinking about having to tie money to my personal work, you know, projects. Just to address the, that question of attribution, what's really interesting, and you might be surprised to hear me say this, is that we have that same issue, in fact, because, you know, these global brands who we work with, they want to control that final product, and they want to present to the world that they are the creators of that that work, and in fact, that none of us sitting up here actually exist. <laughs> you know, that, that, that magically, you know, global brand A created this out of whole cloth. And so it's, it's something that we, as an agency, are always pushing back on. And, you know, uh, because we're concerned when we develop a relationship with whomever it might be, whether it's an obscura or whether it's an individual artist, it's important to us to have a good relationship with the folks who we are working with and to make sure that they're recognized as much as we're recognized because we all realize that, you know, we're creating our reputations and we're creating our, our work. And if we aren't allowed to speak about it, that's a problem. Well, uh, and for those of you who actually have some experience with the art world itself, um, you know, that's also a commercial enterprise. Um, there it also requires perhaps some compromise and things like that. I think uh, uh, Jamie's just had some recent experience. You could talk about that. Um, so I think you're referring to the, uh, the auction, mm -hmm. which is a really amazing experience. Um, and I think the first thing I want to say is that the art world is not a monolithic object. Um, and art is a very broad term. That's actually why it's a really useful moniker, because it gives you so much flexibility. Uh, but there are economic systems at play, you know, that allow for different types of work to happen, and etc. And they function in lots of different ways. You know, one, there's a traditional art market um, where there's galleries and there's secondary art market uh, auctions and there's funding bodies and grants and all of these different things and there's also people that make art for no money at all all the time because they love to so I mean there's every different type of relationship in there you can imagine I I think as long as I you know can feed myself and uh, you know function in, on the planet and be healthy then I choose how I spend my time uh, I have that luxury so I can make art and try and I, I want to sell art I want people to own it I want I, I see the art as being something that I want other people to experience too and uh, you know manufacture scarcity and all these different things that happens whatever but um I don't know there I guess what's the is the question like is there a problem with with this stuff or well just that uh, it, oh, yeah. <laughs> it's also it's it's also a commercial enterprise that there's plenty oh. there's lots of different ways to yeah. uh, build a sustainable practice within art yes uh, working in with ad agencies is one working in the art world they all seem to have tension and we've heard about a lot of them today the music world the same way yeah and um, just that those are things that still have to be negotiated. 
renegotiated. Yeah, so. art is not the pure land of like yeah. ultimate bliss, right? right? I mean, there's problems there too. Mm -hmm. uh, and in advertising, as there's you know issues with uh, like overconsumption and you know overproduction, all these other things, buying things we don't need. In the art world, there's similar issues, um, and you can have a bad master there just as you can in any other space. So I think it's just pretty nuanced, really. Uh, in each case, it's a little different. Well, I'll just uh, have one, more, one last question before uh, we get to some questions uh, from the audience is, uh, is uh, for, for those people who are either just starting out or who are looking for opportunities to help um, uh, you know, monetize their practice in some way or to sustain their practice, um, what would you uh, tell them, an, an, an artist working today on their own work, uh, some good advice for getting to work with agencies, working, uh, you know, uh, how, how to work with them, uh, what to think about when you're approaching them, and um, things like, and then from the agency side, you know, like uh, what, um, you know, what would you like an artist to know before working with you? Um, I guess I can speak to kind of both sides of that. Um, as, as an agency, you know, a, a, as, as a company that employs a, a lot of people, um, I think we have a pretty big responsibility actually to try and create some sort of creative space that people can work within and realize projects um, and it's financially viable. Um, I mean, there are a lot of these different ways to monetize your work. Um, the reality is I think many of them aren't scalable and they're kind of rolling your dice and the vast majority of people are going to have to get a job. Um, I would personally rather get a job working in a kind of, on the kind of things I enjoy doing anyway than um, the kind of Hollywood model of, um, you know, waitressing and trying to act on the side or whatever. I mean, I don't know. Um, so, uh, you know, as a company, we re try very hard to create a space where people can come in, have actual um, ownership over parts, you know, par projects or parts of projects, have real uh, creative input into parts of the work, um, get paid, and, you know, try and do the kind of, the kinds of work that they, you know, love to do. And so, um, and as someone working, I, the other side of it is someone working in one of those spaces. Um, I just think you have to look for places that give you those things. I mean, as much freedom as possible and where you can have a, a entry point into doing the kinds of things you want to do on these projects. I, I completely agree with what you have to say. And, and at, our, at our agency, I know that when we're looking at people to hire, whether it's to be an employee or to work as a partner with us on, on projects, it's a lot of times that personal creativity, you know, we're looking for the painters and the musicians and the jugglers and the, you know, improv people. We've actually got quite a few of those at the agency. We, we're, we're looking for people who are creative in other ways besides being, you know, a copywriter or, you know, a producer or whatever your functional specialty might be. And I think we do a pretty good job of allowing you the the room to be who you are at the same time that you can earn a living and that you can work on projects that become much bigger than maybe you ever thought that they could be. So, yeah. Yeah, I agree with everything that's been said. And just to add to that, I, I feel like there's a lot of different directions people can go now, which is exciting. I mean, from having your own art or design studio to working at an agency um, or to what I'm doing in terms of, a, you know, a tech startup. And we have a lot of people working for us that, um, you know, some, some are obviously technologists, but a lot of them um, are, are not. And um, they're, you know, just they're thinkers or they're designers or they're just doing all sorts of different things that, um, that help build um, the ecosystem. And so I, I think it's just, to your point, like f finding, 
finding something that you're extremely passionate about and so that work doesn't feel like work. I mean, I just, you know, I think probably all of us can say we like getting up every day and doing what we do. And that's probably the most important thing is to follow whatever that is that feels right, um, that makes you feel really excited, you know, and, and not necessarily try to define it or label it, but just figure out where can I work or what can I create myself that people will be attracted to that, um, that, feels, that feels exciting and genuine. Great. Jamie? One, yeah. One little thing about how to work within agency as an artist. Um, I think before I said that it doesn't pose a conflict for me, and I think is for myself, I know where the boundaries are. And I think that's really important. Mm. If you're getting hired by someone to make something, and you think, I'm going to make this amazing piece of art that I want to make, you're going the wrong direction, right? Mm. Like, there's differences there, and you have to see those. And you have to know what the relationship is and what those boundaries are. And if you're working within that, you can be very creative working with somebody else. And then they say, sorry, this has changed. And it's like, that, that's fine. And if you think it's the other way at that point, you've got a problem. Right? Mm -hmm. OK, great. Uh, does anyone have a question for us? Hi. Uh, thanks for mentioning the attribution issue, because every now and then, on, especially on Twitter, I'll see a little uh, explosion of somebody saying, I did this thing and this agency used it and I didn't get any credit for it. And so to just, you know, kind of be talking about that as an issue and thinking about ways um, that the, <laughs> the cred can trickle down from the uh, client through all the different channels. And to that point, I have a question about um, tying back to the open source panel. So I assume in your um, work that you do for clients, you use a lot of open source tools, and I'm wondering if there are any uh, ways that you are currently or would like to in the future um, give back to those communities or those tool sets, whether it's software or hardware, since you're in a position in a sense where there is money coming in uh, from you know, brands that have money. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Barry. <laughs> um, I, uh, uh, let's see. So a couple things in there. The credit is a really interesting one. I, I like to look at film. Um, so in film, there's a very formalized structure of crediting. And like, why is the dude that plugs in the lights get credit in every movie he works in? It's because he fought for that. And the people that did that for years, they, they figured out how to get their, their credits in, in, in there in the film. And, they, and these groups of people collectively worked out this system where people get and a lot of the work we're doing is pretty new now, um, and it's not clear what the different roles sometimes are. It's something we all have to work on. And in the end, it's only going to be to everyone's advantage. Um, and one of the things, Golan Levin did a great talk at FITSI a couple of year ago about this, that really talked a lot about this issue. And you know, as an agency, when you, these agencies get inspired by these things, they look at the, everybody does, they look at all these videos and they make these whole PDFs with all these different things they want to make. And they go and say, and also producers do too. They, they make these lists of like, look at all these projects that I can do, other people's projects. And, um, and I think if you're about to undertake something based on something that someone else has done, the first person you call is them. You know? And hopefully you can hire them to do it. And, if they, and if, that's an easy thing to do. You know? And if they can't do it, then you say, well, you know, we're going to try and get this done another way. And you keep in dialogue. Um, and then briefly about open source. Um, it's great. I just get to use all this free software all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I, I lo I lo we open source a lot. Um, from I, I'll echo the same thing. You know, if if we um, see some sort of uh, code or something out there uh, or, or art that we think would fit in a certain context, we'll get in touch with a person and try and pay them to do it. Um, and if not, usually just go another direction if there's no, you know, there's usually another solution. Um, in terms of open source, it's, yeah, it's a big problem. It's something we, we use open source tools. Um, we don't push uh, our changes back as a, up, upstream as much as I'd like. It's something that I've been trying to work on. Um, we are trying to open source some of our pri proprietary tools, but it's more a matter of just time and logistics than it is desire. So that's the main roadblock. Um, there's just too much, too many uh, 
production related tasks on jobs for us to undertake to really set aside the time to do that. And that's the main roadblock. So I don't have a solution to that yet, but it's being thought about for sure. And then I guess I can just really speak to the attribution issue. Um, I mentioned I have an art buying background, so I have, you know, I'm grounded in, in um, crediting properly and releasing properly. Um, and we do, you know, from typography to illustration to, you know, projects that we see on YouTube, uh, we, we do try and go to the source. And sometimes the source isn't interested. And we'll discuss, you know, can we release this? Can we pay you something? We're going to, we want to riff off of this. So it, it's something we're very conscious of. Oh. So any other uh, questions for us? Or no, looks like looks like it's time for dinner. And <laughs> I, I actually have one more thing, um, just in closing. Um, I'd like to, I guess, thank Isabel and Lisa for putting this panel on and for having such a diverse group of people that are involved in these. I go to a lot of these different types of conferences, um, and we sort of tend to culturally self-select the people that, you know, the types of the types of roles that are considered creative coding and what things are put up on stage. Um, and there's a lot of stuff that usually doesn't get represented. Uh, a lot of Hollywood projects, a lot of people that, you know, there are, there are Maya rigging files that are creative code that, you know, can equally that are extremely impressive. You know, you see these things all the time. And so, you know, um, I would just, I guess it's, uh, there, there's a wide variety of things out there um, in terms of art and creative code and artistic projects. And it's great that we could, you know, get together and share some of the more commercial aspects of it. <laughs>